Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with author and science journalist Nicholas Wade. Nicholas Wade has been a writer for over 30 years. He's worked as a science journalist at places like Nature and Science, which are top science journals, as well as the New York Times. He's written many, many science books on a variety of topics, and I encourage you to check those out. Nicholas Wade is probably one of my all-time favorite science writers, at least that's been around in my lifetime. And I like him for all the reasons that one should like a science writer. He's clear. He explains things very clearly and cleanly in his writing, even when the topics are complex. And to do that, he takes great care to actually understand the underlying science. And there are a lot of people out there that can't do this. A lot of so-called science journalists out there don't really deserve the title because there's a lot of sloppy writing that's that's either lazy or misleading in some way. And Nicholas's writing has always impressed me. He's a great storyteller. He makes things very understandable. The reason that I spoke with Nicholas Wade for this episode has to do with the origins of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic. Nicholas has recently written some articles about this, and these are very detailed, uh, very interesting articles exploring how the evolution of of how we've thought about how this virus arose has actually played out so far. So we talk about the idea of a natural origin or a wildlife spillover event whereby the SARS-CoV-2 virus got into humans by coming into our population from an animal population. And we contrast that with the hypothesis that it actually leaked from a research lab in China. This has been a very controversial area for reasons that have more to do with politics than science. And Nicholas does a great job at sort of painting a picture of, of why that is for us and discussing what exactly the evidence is today for each of these hypotheses as to where this virus originated. And when we also talk about, you know, who's been involved in in this controversy, we talk about what the evidence is for one hypothesis or the other. And he's very careful to state that we actually don't know the answer yet. We really don't know where this, how this virus originated. We don't know if it came as a wildlife spillover event coming to our population from another species of animal, or if this leaked accidentally from a laboratory studying coronaviruses. So we lay out all the facts, Nicholas lays out all the facts for us, and we talk about where this could go in the next few months. So if you're interested in the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 pandemic, especially where this virus actually came from and how it became a pandemic in the first place, this is a great place to start. You can also check out, again, those two articles that Nicholas Wade has written recently that are on Medium by simply Googling his name. I'll also link to those in the episode description. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Nicholas Wade. Nicholas Wade, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Can you start out by just explaining for people who you are and, and what your background is and what you've been doing recently? Um, I'm a science journalist. I worked 
<clears throat> on Nature and Science, the two scientific journals, which have news sections. And then for many years, I worked on the New York Times, where I was an editorial writer and a science reporter and a science editor. And I retired from that a few years ago and have been writing books and as a distraction, an article on the origin of COVID-19, uh, COVID I'm sorry, and SARS-2, its positive virus. Yeah, that's that's largely what we're going to talk about today. And and for those that don't know, I'll link to this stuff in the episode description. But Nicholas has written two articles um, relatively recently about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. And those are wonderfully uh, well-written articles that are very detailed. And they sort of cover the story, the evolving story of how we've been thinking about where this pandemic, how this pandemic got started and, and where this virus actually came from. And so before we get into the present pandemic and SARS-2, I thought it would be nice to talk about some previous outbreaks that have happened. So can you start by describing what the SARS-1 virus was and, and what actually happened in terms of how that virus broke out into human populations? So the SARS or one virus um, caused an epidemic in, in uh, 2003, and it turned out that it came from bats. It was part of a large group of, of viruses called coronaviruses that uh, bats are, uh, carry many different varieties of. Uh, it, it seemed to have spread first from bats to an uh, animal called civets that is sold for meat in Chinese wet markets. And from the civets, it jumped to people uh, and uh, eventually caused a serious uh, epidemic. Hmm. And so, why are you know bats seem to come up a lot when we when we talk about viral outbreaks that eventually get to humans? Is there something special about bats in terms of why they're such a seemingly common common reservoir for viruses? Um, yes, there is a, a biological reason, and I'm I'm sorry, I forget what it is. I think it's partly to do with that they live in these close communities, so uh, circulate viruses and bacteria among themselves a lot. So uh, that gives them quite a sort of strong uh, immunity and enables them to carry these viruses without it hurting them much. But the viruses certainly hurt us when they manage to spill over. I see. And so you mentioned that with SARS-1, it went from bats into this other creature called a civet, and then into humans who are in close contact with those creatures in wet markets. It seems like it's common when something spills over to a human that it hops from something like a bat into some other animal first before going to humans. Is that is that a common pattern? And why does it sort of jump from one species to another before getting to humans? I think it may be a matter of opportunity because if it, sort of, if it sees the other animal first, especially if it's in the wild, it may not sort of come in contact with humans very much. So it'll seize the opportunity to, to, to get to an intermediate animal and then to humans. But of course, some, I mean, many viruses do infect humans directly. The, the Ebola virus, for example, which we think come from, comes from bats, that seems to be a direct transmission. Uh, there's some thought that SARS two may be able to infect humans directly, but there's no proof of that. It's just a conjecture. I see. So in the case of SARS-1, it got to humans from civets at these wet markets. Is that why this has been sort of a, a candidate, a favored hypothesis for SARS-2 originating in some of these wet markets? Uh, yes, exactly. And there was a second epidemic called MERS in 2012. And there the intermediary animals, um, camels or dromedaries, uh, so when the COVID-19 broke out uh, and it was clearly a, a, a bat type virus, the natural thought was that, well, it had, it had come by a similar route to the two previous outbreaks via some intermediary animal to humans. I see. And so in the case of SARS-1 and MERS, you've got two viruses that went from bats to another animal to humans, but we then identified that they actually made that progression by identifying the animals that they that they came from. How long did it take in the case of SARS-1 and MERS for scientists to figure out what those intermediate animal hosts were? Well, it was pretty quick. It was about four months in the case uh, of, of SARS-1, and I think it was about seven months uh, in the case of, of MERS. So the intermediate animals were identified very quickly. It took, it took quite a lot longer to identify the uh, original SARS-1 virus in the sort of bat 
in the particular cave where the bats harboring it lived. And the MERS virus, although it's a bat type virus, we haven't linked that to its source. And it's not very clear how it got from bats to dromedaries. I see. But they found the intermediate species within a matter of months. That's true. Okay. So in the when, when this happens, when the virus goes from a bat to another animal to a human, does it leave any sort of signatures in its genome that scientists can see that allow us to piece together sort of what that progression was at the, at the level of its genetics? Uh, yes, it certainly does. I mean, v- viruses are sort of specialized o- o- to attack their host animals, and it's quite difficult for them to attack a- another host. And they depend on a sort of series of mutations uh, to adapt themselves. So w- when you look at the progression of SARS-1 uh, to civics and to humans, you see it making about sort of six or six or so critical mutations before it establishes itself in, in civics, and another six or so before it begins to be able to attack humans just as a sort of weak pathogen, and another dozen before it's a really strong pathogen in humans. So you can track all these mutational changes. And of course, that's what people expected to find with SARS, but they didn't. Hmm. So the idea is when it's when a virus is hopping from a bat to another animal, it's going to take a number of mutations usually before it figures out how to get into that other animal and then basically adapt to that other animal so it becomes more contagious. And then another set of mutations again to go from that animal to a human, to be able to get inside the human population and then to spread more quickly and become a pandemic type virus. Is that, that that's what we're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly true. I mean, it seems easy when we for the virus when we look at it, but in fact, it's immensely difficult for the virus. It has millions or billions of tries before uh, uh, picking up each successful mutation. So it's a very, uh, so di- uh, it's a very difficult process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the basic idea is when the virus first, like the very first virus gets into humans at the initial stage of some kind of spillover, it's actually not, it can get into humans, obviously, but it's actually not that good at spreading. And it has to get some of those new mutations over some time period to become very contagious, basically. And have we seen that kind of signature with SARS-2? No, that's one of the very surprising features about uh, SARS-2, especially from the natural emergence uh, perspective. You'd, you'd, you'd think that it would take a long time to become a, a very virulent human pathogen. And yet, right out of the box, it was very good at infecting humans. Uh, so that's much easier to explain on the lab leak hypothesis, because when you're working with these viruses, you grow them in, in, in human-like surroundings, either in, in, in cultures of human airway cells uh, or in, in humanized mice. These are mice genetically engineered to have the human ACE2 receptor uh, uh, expressed on their airway cells. That's the, the target for, uh, for these SARS-type Viruses. Now, obviously, if you if you grow a mice in uh, if you grow a virus in humanized mice or in cultures of humanized uh, 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 of human airway cells, if it escapes, it's going to be very good at infecting humans because that's exactly what it's being trained to do. Hmm. So, at the early stages of this pandemic with SARS two, the virus was already really good at being virulent at going from person to person relatively easily, which is not what you typically see at the beginning of a viral pandemic that's due to a wildlife spillover, as we saw with SARS-1. Now, if we go back to earlier into this pandemic, so around February 2020, if people recall what they were hearing and what they were doing at that time, uh, at this time, it was considered by most people, at least you know what I was seeing in the media and in journals and elsewhere, that the lab leak hypothesis was uh, not likely. In fact, many people were calling it a conspiracy theory, and it was stated uh, publicly by many people, many prominent people, that uh, the wildlife origin hypothesis was overwhelmingly likely. And in one of your Medium articles, you talk about this. In particular, you quote uh, a Lancet article. Uh, from February 2020, that says, quote, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. So who was writing that article and what was the basis for those claims at the time? 
Well, the article, it, it turned out, was organized by uh, Peter Daszak, who is uh, the president of the EcoHealth Alliance, a, a nonprofit in New York, which uh, funds was funding research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology on bat viruses. So this money comes ultimately from the National Institutes of Health, and particularly the NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It goes from there to the EcoHealth Alliance and from there to Wuhan in China. So Dr. Daszak had an enormous conflict of interest in publishing this letter in the Lancet saying this couldn't possibly be lab, lab leak because if indeed had, it had leaked from the experiments he was supporting and was responsible for, uh, then he would stand to be uh, be held responsible in, in, in one or many ways. So not only did he have this undeclared conflict of interest, but to add insult to injury, the letter in the Lancet concludes by saying, we declare no conflict of interest. <laughs> and, and, the, and this pertained not just to Dr. Daszak, but most of the signatories uh, had ties to the EcoHealth Alliance, uh, also the Wuhan Institute in, in various ways. And the other signatory who's worth mentioning, because he comes into the story later, uh, uh, is a man called Jeremy Farah, who is the uh, president of the Wellcome Foundation, the Wellcome Trust in London, which is a big medical research philanthropy and is the source of, of much funding for virology and other kinds of research. Um, Dr. Farah has close ties with Chinese medical officials, uh, which he describes in a book he wrote recently called uh, Spike. Uh, and uh, uh, he certainly have, seems to have been um, uh, following the, the wishes of the Chinese uh, medical authorities in various actions he took, not only in signing the Lancet letter, but in various other other things which show we can discuss later. So well, there's a lot to dig into here. Let's before before we go go more into the personalities and some of the details of how things progressed from this time uh, in back in February to the present. Let's talk a little bit more about who, uh, excuse me, about um, gain of function research itself, uh, because that that comes up a lot, and I'm sure people have heard about it. What exactly is gain of function research? And also, what exactly is the lab leak hypothesis, as opposed to say um, the conjecture that that it was that was purposely engineered? So, uh, gain of function um, it, it, it's subject to many several different definitions, and that's part of the reason why there's uh, uh, such controversy about it. In its most basic sense, is anything you do to enhance uh, the uh, the infectivity or transmissibility of a virus. So you have to be careful here because even the slightest handling of a virus in a lab, for example, if you grow a virus in a culture of cells, mm -hmm. you're increasing its capacity because you're sort of training it to infect this culture of cells. So if you define gain of function too severely, you could sort of cripple all virological research, which no one wants to do. But what it means in its more serious sense is if you take a, a, a sort of dangerous, a dangerous human pathogen and you suit that up in the lab, that's sort of real, that's really dangerous gain of function. And that is what people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. What would be some examples in recent history of gain of function research? And what are the, what are the basic arguments for and against doing this kind of research in general? Well, the experiment that started it all off about uh, 10 years ago was uh, when uh, Dutch researchers learned how to uh, enhance the infectivity of the influenza virus um, in ferrets. Um, they learned how to make it, uh, well, infect ferrets just more easily than they did before. So the virus had, had a gain of function. So the purpose of this research was to see how you know, a similar uh, event might occur in viruses infecting humans and, and how to try and prevent that happening. So that was the legitimate research purpose, but it, it set off all kinds of alarm bells because if you do such an experiment in humans, you've created 
a dangerous virus that did not exist before, and, and there's the risk you, you could set off a human uh, epidemic if the virus escaped. And, and there's a long, long history of viruses escaping from labs when people seriously did not mean them to. Mm -hmm. And they're just very hard to contain. So that set off a debate within the virological community about gain of function. And it, it kind of sort of fissioned into two uh, uh, camps. It's like so two groups sort of fighting under a tent. You can't really tell what's uh, happening. But the, 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 the group that was in, in favor of restraining gain of function managed to get a, a, a moratorium on federal funding, a uh, 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 a regulation put into law in 2014. So the moratorium said you can't fund any new gain of function research. But, but that victory was short lived because uh, uh, the, the proponents of gain of function managed to get the moratorium ended in 2017. And it was replaced um, by a sort of reporting requirement, which didn't, doesn't have very many teeth in it. But basically, it said if you're doing gain of function, you have to tell this government committee what you plan to do and they can veto it if they wish to. So it's a very loose uh, regulatory system. It's turned down very few requests um, and gain of function research essentially has gone on without really very much Im impediment, I think that's fair to say. Certainly far, far less impediment than many critics would like to see. I see. So basically you've got two schools of thought in the virology community. One is basically saying something like, we need to understand the paths that viruses might take throughout the natural course of evolution to become more infectious. And if we can actually sort of recreate what could happen naturally, then we'll sort of be one step ahead of a pandemic. And then you've got another camp saying, well, that may be true, but you're literally creating such a virus in doing that kind of research. And it's really about sort of a risk benefit analysis of some kind with the risks of creating a virus that is going to be deadly or more contagious or whatever, versus having that kind of uh, that picture of what could emerge naturally that might allow you to, to take a more defensive approach. Yeah, that's exactly so. And so who are some who who have been some of the chief um, I know that there's been some important people that have argued in favor of doing this kind of gain of function research, um, at least in the U.S. Um, who have been some of those people? Well, the two most prominent have been Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci. So Fauci is the director of the NIAID and is sort of immediately responsible for virological research uh, in the U.S. And, and, and to some extent abroad. And Collins is his nominal boss. Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health, of which the NIAID is part. Is part. So what I found. they wrote a, a well-known um, letter uh, in the Washington Post, I think it was 10 years ago, advocating the importance of uh, uh, gain-of-function research. Now, the principal critic uh, is Richard Ebright at Rutgers University, um, who has been very eloquent uh, in in saying that experiments like those being, being supported by NIAD uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology should never have been undertaken. I see. So there's these two camps, there's arguments for and against doing this type of research. Um, we can be agnostic for the moment about you know which, which camp um, makes better arguments, but you can make arguments in both directions, and, and very prominent scientists have, have done that so far in the past few sure. years. Um, and then just to sort of round this out, when we talk about a lab leak, we're not talking about someone engineering a nasty bug and then purposefully letting it out. We're talking literally about an accident. You know, some people are working with viruses in the lab. Viruses are very tiny creatures, obviously, and they're very hard to contain. Um, you're saying that these accidents commonly... Can you talk about how common su such a leak is and, and maybe what some of the containment procedures typically are? Well, I think it's fair to say that on average, there's about sort of one serious leak a year reported, and probably many more that do not get reported. Hmm. Um, it sort of goes in, in, in waves. And the smallpox virus, which is one of the things you would most want to contain very securely, has escaped three times from labs in England in the 1970s, killing, I think, 30 uh, people. And coming to more recent times, the SARS-1 
virus is a real escape artist. Uh, that's escaped six times already in its short uh, laboratory uh, life, four times alone mm-hmm. from the Beijing Institute of Virology. So the way these, these viruses are contained, the, the, the safety system, it has sort of four levels called BSL-1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, BSL-1 is sort of nothing. Um, BSL-2 is sort of, you know, ha- hang a safety hazard on the door and don't do any mouth pipetting. And level three is, well, you use containment boxes for some of the more uh, aerosol spreading organizations. So all the, and all these are sort of pretty low level, you know, not sure to above common sense. Uh, then there's a big jump w- when you go to uh, BSL level four. Um, so that, that is where you have to wear sort of space suits and, and have negative airflow and, and special, specially built buildings. Um, and the problem here is that virologists do not like to work in BSL-4 level conditions. It's, it's very expensive. It's a headache. It takes you 10 times as long to do uh, in the experiment. Um, it's just something you'd really rather avoid. And, and it's hard not to think that that distaste is sort of written into the the safety regulations that govern what level is appropriate for each kind of virus. So it, it may surprise you to, uh, to know, it certainly surprised me, that you can work with, um, but if you, when it comes to the SARS viruses, if you're working with either of the known causes of the epidemic, the SARS-1 virus or MERS, you have to use BSL level three. If you're working with any SARS-related virus, even if it's the closest known cousin of SARS-1 or MERS, you can do that in BSL level two, which, as Richard Ebright has famously pointed out, is about the safety level you find in the average dentist's office. <laughs> so you can work with some of these bugs at that level of security, and and I can understand the mindset too. I mean, I I used to do academic research with mice, and I used to work in a building where, you know, to go get the mice or to uh, where the mice were housed, there was a special room in, in an upper level and you had to, you know, put on a hairnet and like a safety suit and you had to go through like an air shower. And all of this was purely precautionary. There was no uh, no serious risk of anything like an outbreak of, of a bacterial or a, or a virus that could infect humans. It was all just precautionary for working with uh, these mammalian critters. And you know, it, it was just a huge pain in the ass. People complained all the time about having to go all the way upstairs and putting on the hair and putting on this. So there's this, this natural sort of human tendency to want to put in um, as little effort as possible to get the job done. Right. And it's so it's it's not hard to imagine why why that mindset w- wouldn't apply in a virology lab as well. So, okay, what you're saying is if we transfer. So if I go back again to early 2020. When Peter Daszak was making these statements about how ludicrous it was to consider a lab leak, what you're saying is already at that time we knew that um, a the SARS-2 virus didn't have the kind of mutational signatures one would expect if it had come from wildlife similar to SARS-1, and we also knew at the time that you know viruses leaking from labs is something that's not a freak occurrence; it actually happens fairly often. Well, not only did he know that, he, he knew in detail the experiments that he had been supporting at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And these experiments consisted of, of taking the spike proteins from one SARS-type virus and sticking them into the backbone of another type uh, SARS-type virus. And these experiments were very successful in their own terms in that the, the new hybrid gain-of-function viruses that he created were all uh, more virulent and infective than their parents. Uh, so he knew these uh, uh, experiments were underway. And, and what is more, uh, if I can sort of jump ahead to an, an astounding piece of information that, that came available just last week, uh, which was the leak of a research proposal that DASAC had made part of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. He, the, the Wuhan Institute researchers were thinking of, of what they were looking for uh, 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 cl- appropriate human-related cleavage sites, including the furin cleavage site, to insert into their viruses. 
So we may be jumping ahead a little, but the, 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 the crucial part of, of, of SARS-2 and the sort of the, the, the sort of whole riddle to where it comes from is a, an element called the furin cleavage site. And we now know that even though the DARPA actually turned down this proposal, we now know that the, the, uh, uh, the experiment of inserting furin cleavage site into viruses was actively being considered uh, by the Wuhan Institute researchers in 2018. Hmm. So Dasak knew that the exact recipe for creating a SARS, the SARS-2-like virus had already been co- at least contemplated and maybe had been put into practice as well. So in light of this knowledge, it's very hard not to interpret his his protests as 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 being because he feared the the very opposite had happened. He protested that lab leak was a r- ridiculous possibility because he knew it was not. Hmm. Let's let's unpack some of this biology a little bit to help people think about this better. So you mentioned this thing called the uh, furin cleavage site. So can you can you explain briefly? how this virus actually infects and get into, get, gets inside of human cells and what that cleavage site has to do with it. So the virus is made of attacks sort of, uh, is, 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 is a, a sort of two punch one. First, it latches on to its target, which is the a, a protein called the ACE2 receptor. Then the second, the second half of the virus is spike, the spikes that sort of jet out from the surface uh, all over, has to be cut away from the first part so that it can then merge its membrane with that of the cells uh, and inject its RNA into the cell and hijack the cell's approach and making machinery. So to make that cut between the, the two parts of the virus, the virologists call them S, the S1 and S2 parts of, of the spike protein, to make the, the cut between S1 and S2, the virus relies on, on enzymes that are naturally present on its target cell. Uh, and the bat virus relies on, on various other sort of bat type proteins, but, but Virologists have known for some time that you can really soup up a virus and make it a super human pathogen if you if you provide it with a way of recognizing a protein very very commonly expressed on human airway cells called furin. So furin is sitting there to cleave various proteins that are sort of circulating in the in the human media, but if you insert if you insert into your virus's um, spike protein gene the specific sequence of amino acids that is recognized by furin, then your virus is going to have a much easier task of infecting human airway cells because there'll be furin proteins all around to help cleave its spike protein, cutting off the S1 part, allowing the S2 part to deploy. So lo and behold, when you look at the SARS-2 virus, the most distinctive feature of it that comes out to any virologist is that right at the S1, S2 junction, just where it needs to have one, is a furin cleavage site. That's a, a sequence of, of amino acids that is recognized by a furin. Hmm. And the other remarkable feature is that SARS-2 is the only member of its viral family that has this site. Its, its viral family is called the SARS-BECO virus, uh, and, and the SARS-1 virus and the MERS virus uh, belong to it, and many other SARS-type viruses that the Wuhan researchers have found. So this is sort of quite a large uh, family, uh, and SARS-2 is the only one so far known that has a furin cleavage site. Hmm. So if you look at all of the sort of coronaviruses related to SARS-2, SARS-2 is the only one that has any trace of this site. And the site is basically the perfect sequence one would need if you were a virus who wanted to be uh, infecting human cells, because you're taking advantage of, of a human protein that's actually necessary to clip that spike protein in order for it to get inside. Yes, that's right. I should just say that the, the coronavirus is the sort of great big family of viruses and the Sarbeco viruses are a little subfamily within the coronaviruses. So there are furin cleavage 
sites in in other coronaviruses. It's just that as far as the Sarbeco virus is concerned, it's only SARS-2 that has the furin cleavage site. Mm-hmm. So is it fair to say that um, it's conceivable that such a site could have gotten right, right at that particular spot for this virus through natural evolution, but it would have been... Um, <clears throat> quite a remarkable mutation or a recombination event that would have happened to get it right there. But with the lab leak sort of hypothesis view of this, it's quite trivial because molecular biologists can, can just use standard lab techniques to put it right, right there. Um, yes, that, that's right. Uh, on, on the natural emergence thesis, and the only, the only way a virus could a, a acquire a sort of a, a long string of, of, of new genetic material like this would not be for the mutation, which just just sort of one base at a time, but it would be through recombination. That's when two viruses, two very similar viruses, infect the same cell, and they reassemble their parts, each with 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 parts that belong to the other virus. So that that's how viruses uh, acquire new uh, genetic properties. Uh, recombination happens all the time. But the one thing you cannot acquire through recombination is a genetic element that your family of viruses does not possess. Hmm. So since the Sarbeco viruses, so far as we know, do not possess the furin cleavage site, it's hard to see how SARS-CoV-2 could have got it that way. It's hmm. much easier, as you say, to suppose that it was inserted there in the lab uh, uh, by people who, who, who wanted to soup up the virus. And now that we have this grant proposal, to, to DARPA from the EcoHealth Alliance. We know that this is exactly the procedure that the Wuhan researchers had in mind. Hmm. So, you know, DARPA is going to approve funding, uh, approve grants that go to this thing called the EcoHealth Alliance run by Peter Daszak. And then you're saying that that group can then sort of subcontract or send portions of those grants out to places like the Wuhan Institute of Virology. How does how does that chain of command work exactly? Uh, well, the, the, these are U.S. government uh, grants. So <clears throat> the principal ones go from NIAID to the EcoHealth Alliance. And, and the other for investigator, that's the guy who's sort of responsible for the research and the grant, is Peter Daszak. And he then subcontracts uh, people at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, particularly Shi Zheng Li, who is the chief Chinese coronavirus expert. Mm-hmm. Now, so, so why is there, so EcoHealth Alliance, I understand that piece. EcoHealth Alliance is based in New York City. Is Peter Daszak himself running a lab in New York and, and only a subset of the research goes out to places like Wuhan Institute of Virology or, or how does that work? Well, it's a very natural question because my having said he's a principal investigator, you, you assume he's a scientist with a lab, but he's not. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have a lab. He, he's just a, a grant, a grant raiser and administrator. He's a sort of research entrepreneur. So all the all the scientific work is done. Uh, uh, I should say almost all the scientific work is done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And just huh. to jump back a second to your question about the the, the grants, the, the main the main grant from NIAID. Uh, via EcoHealth to the Wuhan Institute lasted for, it was a five-year grant and it lasted from 2014 to 2019. There was then a second grant from NIAID, which was quickly rescinded uh, after the epidemic broke out. Now, the proposal to DARPA was made in 2018 and DARPA did not fund it. It was a bit too risky even for DARPA, but its importance is in is in, firstly ensuring what experiments were, were being contemplated at WIAV. And it, it doesn't necessarily follow that the experiments were not done just because they weren't funded, because it's routine in research to use, use your money at the end of your the end of one grant to perform experiments that will support application for a second grant. Mm-hmm. So these experiments may well have been done, even though DARPA did not fund the grant. Yeah, that makes sense. So Peter Daszak is not 
actually running a lab himself. He's, he's sort of a professional grant writer. Is he? Is this all virology, virology research that the EcoHealth Alliance is funding? Is he a vir- virologist? Is that his specialty? It is virological research, but he's not a virologist. <clears throat> he has a PhD in parasitology from the University of East London. Interesting. So his job is basically a professional grant writer to fund virology research, but he's not a virologist himself. Yes, that's correct. I wonder, I wonder how, how he got that job. Um, so let's move to, um, well, let's move a little bit forward in time now. So, so time has gone by. Um, some of these statements from Peter Daszak and others have come out. Um, there was another one that I, that I thought was interesting that you mentioned in your article. So there was another opinion piece. So this was not a scientific experiment or a scientific paper. It was an opinion piece, but it appeared in a scientific journal in March of 2020. So so about a month after the Lancet article that we referenced previously. And this was from someone named Christian Anderson. And so what were the main arguments of that piece? And can you also talk a little bit about whether or not there was any sort of public dissection or criticism of this from other scientists? Well, the, 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 the Christian Anderson uh, article is very important because this was the sort of principal scientific statement that persuaded um, the media in general and everyone else that uh, lab leak was uh, imp- impossible and, and a ridiculous conspiracy theory. And the second thing I would say in background is that <clears throat> Jeremy Farrow, who we've mentioned earlier, has, has said that he put together the authors of this Nature Medicine article. So it was he, he claims, who suggested to Christian Anderson uh, that, that he should write this piece. So the article starts out by saying that it's impossible for the, vi- for the SARS-2 virus to have been manipulated in a lab. So this is a totally irresponsible thing for a scientist to say. Uh, I mean, it's really bad when scientists present themselves to the public as speaking in a professional capacity and assure the public of things that they cannot know are true. So Dr. Anderson could not have known what he said, that it was impossible to manipulate the virus, because there are many ways of manipulating viruses that leave no trace. I mm-hmm. mean, the obvious one is you just grow them in cell culture, you passage them from one cell culture to another, and under this sort of fierce selective process, they gain new functions. So natural selection has done all the heavy lifting, but you cannot tell from the virus that comes out at the other end that it's been subject to to this selective process. Also, you can you can now insert genetic elements into virus without, into viruses without leaving a trace. <clears throat> and the old methods did leave sort of fingerprints where the restriction enzymes had cut, but they're now new, very neat methods. Well, they're not that new. They're called the no seam method or the seamless method. You you and you can insert you can insert elements without leaving any trace at all. So what Anderson and his colleagues was was saying was the pure propaganda and completely untrue. Okay, so you're saying he, it's not like he, there was a subtle misspeaking of, of something. He was saying things that were quite clearly not true. And, and I would imagine if that was the case and it was in a place like Nature Medicine, that certainly other scientists with the relevant expertise would have seen this and said something about it. Uh, well, that's a very good supposition. So the question is, why didn't they speak out? And I'm afraid there was, <clears throat> you know, this, this, this goes to the structure of our, our current academic communities. I mean, scientists, a- academics have tenure and the public thinks, well, they've got tenure. They're totally independent. They can say what they like without, uh, without fear. But in fact, the opposite is the case because scientists are especially very dependent on their colleagues for getting grants for you're finding jobs for their students, writing recommendations. So you hesitate strongly to say something that is uh, unpopular or that may be frowned on by the authorities. So here is a sort of eminent sort of research funder like Jeremy Farrow, who's you, you're more, almost the equivalent of Francis Collins, Anthony Fauci in the US. You're publicly saying this is a ridiculous conspiracy theory, and and you're sort of undermining the whole enterprise if you say otherwise. So no one, no one in that circumstance is going to sort of stand out and and say this paper by Anderson and his colleagues is bullshit. 
No one said a word. The 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 media was was slowed by it, it despite the fact that, that that major media outlets, newspapers, and television uh, 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 enterprises all have science journalists who are supposed to be able to sort of see through uh, uh, see see through statements like this and treat their sources skeptically. In fact, they all sort of lapped it up um, and 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 just repeated the. The dogma that the whole, well, the consensus of the scientific community is this must certainly have emerged naturally. There's no chance it was a lab leak. Then this mm-hmm. this view prevailed for a full year and a half. Yeah, I, I actually remember when that article came out, and I just remember people pointing to it and saying, "Hey, this is a piece from Nature Medicine. It says it says things are, are quite clear." Um, you mentioned Peter Daszak had a conflict of interest that he did not cite in that Lancet article. Does Christian Anderson have any such conflict here? Well, Anderson has a problem of a much deeper kind, it seems to me. And this comes from another leaked email. <clears throat> um, on January 31st of, of, of 2020, just after, uh, it was about two weeks after the, the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 first came to light. Anderson had been vigorously studying it with the help of several uh, colleagues. Uh, I don't know at whose behest he'd done this. Probably, you know, he just done it off his own bat, maybe. But anyway, he wrote an email to Anthony Fauci saying that he and his colleagues had unanimously decided the virus was not natural. He, he I forget the exact phrase, but he said, "We, it, it does not follow. We, we, it does not. There's no, there's no good evolutionary explanation for it." And he referred uh, indirectly to the Furin cleavage site. Hmm. So on January 31st, Anderson was convinced, pretty much convinced that the virus was man-made. Now, another leaked email from Anderson four days later, he has changed his view 180 degrees. He is saying lab leak is a ridiculous conspiracy theory. So you have to ask what made him change his mind. And no, and no one really knows. All we do know, again, from leaked emails, is that there was a, a conference call held the following day, uh, uh, organized by Farah uh, and Fauci were present. And so uh, was uh, Anderson and uh, Eddie Holmes, who is uh, a well-known English virologist who works in Australia, and various other virologists. Now, it's important to note that, that Fauci and Farah, between them, control a big part of all virology research funds available in the Western world. So if you're a research virologist, you're going to be very careful to listen to what they say and what they might want you to say. And it seems that we have no proof of this, that at this teleconference, Anderson and Holmes, who had unanimously, they and two other people, they had unanimously decided the virus was man-made the evening before, (laughs) were told, Sorry, guys, you've got the wrong answer. Please think again. Hmm. And lo and behold, two days later, we had this email from Anderson saying, it's ridiculous to think this is a conspiracy theory. So was there any new evidence that came to light? It, it seems there was not. And, and both Anderson and Farah in his book make out that this process of deliberation was a long scientific process, weighing all the facts and analysis. Many sleepless nights we spent on this, Farah said. This does not square with the the February 4 email from Anderson that says already just two days after the conference, he changed his mind 180 degrees. So this is the guy, along with Holmes and two others who co-authored the Nature Medicine article, they give the reader not the slightest hint that they had began, begun by thinking this virus was, was man-made. They do not do the reader the courtesy of explaining that even though it looks man-made, then this is what we thought originally, nonetheless, for reasons X, Y, and Z, we've come to the opposite conclusion. That would be playing straight with the reader. They did not play straight. The other question that comes up is, you know, when you've got U.S. agencies that are responsible for funding research, 
why why is it that the money's ending up at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China? Naively, one might think that we're only going to be funding U.S. research. So, so what exactly are the dots that that we can connect there? How does that work? Uh, well, I think there's a reasonable explanation for that. I mean, Fauci, you know, regards himself as responsible for, and rightly so, for sort of protecting the U.S. populace at the least, and others too, maybe from from outbreaks of new epidemics. So, but for, from his perspective, it doesn't really matter where the epidemic mm-hmm. is concerned, he wants to know about it and try to prevent it. So we've already had sort of two epidemics coming out of these bat viruses. So it seems to me a very natural, a reasonable sort of research proposition for Fauci to fund money into sort of trying to study these, these bat populations and see what, what else is in store for us. And further, it was perfectly reasonable for him to sponsor a collaboration with uh, Xi Zheng Li, who is, who's the leading Chinese uh, coronavirus expert. All, all that seems perfectly reasonable. It's just that when you get down into the details and you see that she was doing highly dangerous gain of function experiments in minimally safe uh, conditions, and, and her overseer was, was Peter Daszak, who does not have a degree in virology, and and who knows whether or not he was competent to assess the risks. It, it's there that you begin to see a rather uh, questionably executed research program. But the sort of general framework in which it takes place is perfectly reasonable, it seems to me. I see. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So if we're interested in preventing outbreaks that can occur anywhere in the world and often start outside the U.S., we those agencies have the authority to fund research that's not happening in the U.S. because because we might just want to know about it, where it's going to start elsewhere. Right. So talk to us more about Dr. Xi. So what's her background and how did she sort of get into this position? And, and what's sort of the general umbrella of research going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Um, well, she, uh, she, she is a very, a very capable uh, virologist. Uh, she uh, trained with the French and then she worked with Ralph Barrick um, at the University of North Carolina, who's the leading American uh, expert on uh, coronaviruses. And then having learned a lot of, of techniques from Barrick, she, she went back to the Wuhan Institute uh, where she's head of her own uh, lab. And uh, she's started working on, on, on these bat viruses. Uh, uh, she, uh, she identified the uh, the the cave where viruses exist almost certainly were the source of the SARS-1 virus. That was her big specific achievement. And since then, she's been back many times to the uh, caves uh, to collect viruses. And in particular, she went back to a cave in Mojiang, where there was an incident in 2012 where six miners who were sort of digging out bat guano uh, and heavily exposed to, to, to bat viruses, became very seriously ill, and three of them died, and the other three are very seriously sick. So this is a very important uh, incident, which she has tried to cover up, um, but nonetheless was ascertained in, uh, by, by, by other means. So she was, she was working with these potentially lethal viruses uh, that had killed the miners, and the these viruses were not transmitted by the miners to anyone else. So they lacked transmissibility, but they were lethal. And this seems to have been what has occupied she uh, ever, ever since. I want to paint a, a better picture for people too about some of the research that happens here. We, we've touched on some things before. We've talked about things like humanized mice. So the idea is, you know, people are going around the world, they're going into these bat caves and, and scooping up uh, you know, bat viruses and other things. They're bringing all of these things back to the lab, and they want to do various experiments that help teach us about um, how, these, how these viruses work, how they might um, naturally hop from one species to another. And all of this is done in good faith, right? It's all done with the idea of, of actually preventing uh, a kind of outbreak from happening. But when they get back to the lab and they're infecting human cells in a dish with viruses, or they're using humanized mice. What exactly does that mean? What is a humanized mouse? Well, it's a, a mouse um, a, a genetically engineered to carry the uh, ACE2 receptor, uh, the, the human version of it, uh, 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 in its airway cells. Uh, the, the, 
the mice were um, um, uh, uh, developed, I believe, by Ralph Barrick, and he uh, uh, gave, uh, gave some to she, and that's what she's been um, working with. So, in effect, they're like they're like little humans, uh, as far as as far as a, a, vir a virus infectivity experiment uh, is is concerned. I see. So, so we can genetically engineer mice so that part of their body, some of their cells basically look or act just like human cells. And I would imagine if you are working with viruses that become adapted to such an animal, they're now sort of pre-adapted to infecting humans and therefore they can more easily spill over into humans. Uh, yes, that's exactly true. So at this point, at this point in time today, is it fair to say we don't, there's no smoking gun. We don't actually know if this was a wildlife spillover for certain, and we don't actually know if it was a lab leak for certain. We actually are lacking some of that, that key evidence that would tell us with certainty whether it was one or the other. Yes, I agree with the way you put that. We've got two hypotheses on the table. Both are very plausible. We've got no direct evidence for either, so, so we should keep both in, in mind. Um, but we do have quite a lot of circumstantial evidence in favor of lab leak, and in particular, this uh, DARPA proposal uh, establishing that the Wuhan researchers were thinking of inserting furin cleavage sites into lab viruses. Yeah, so they were at the very least contemplating that they could make a virus just like this. They could insert that furin cleavage site exactly as we see it in the viral genome at exactly the right place. And this is not, right, this was not like a new technique or new proposal, right? This is something that has been done in other circumstances. Well, right, right. The virologists have known for some time that this is a good way to soup up viruses. So there are at least 10 or 11 experiments in the literature, including, I believe, one by Dr. She, in which furin cleavage sites have been inserted into viruses. So what would uh, what would a smoking gun look like? What what kind of evidence are we looking for, and where might we find it? Well, I suppose the real smoking gun would be um, the viral backbone into which uh, the, the the spike protein and the furin cleavage site were inserted. So let's assume that. That, that SARS-2 was generated in the lab, one of these experiments you described, which you're trying to sort of you know, trace or predict the, the possible spill parts of spillover from bats to humans. So you would take a, a particular virus as your, as your sort of backbone virus. And the Wuhan Institute has, we know that they have at least a hundred of these viruses that they have not published that are, that are in their data banks and they could have used. And then they take, a spike protein from some other virus and then insert it into this backbone. A smoking gun will be well, the records of such an experiment, and, and in particular, the, the particular the virus which they used as the as the backbone. I think, and, and along with lab records, of course, it, it's not very likely the Chinese authorities are ever going to allow that to happen. So, I think if you want. <clears throat> If we're looking for proof, we're going to, at some stage, have to be satisfied with something a notch short of proof. Mm -hmm. And what would what would proof of a, a natural wildlife spillover scenario look like? Well, that would be very easy to obtain. And in the case of of SARS one, for example, uh, we have all the we have the intermediary host uh, uh, carrying the the virus. We have all the human. Uh, all the human epidemiology is showing the virus sort of gathering mutations uh, one by one. Uh, we have uh, we can see that the virus made the the jump to humans several times. I mean, this is something that doesn't necessarily happen just once. If it's going to happen at all, it'll happen several times. So, in both the SARS one and MERS epidemics, we can see these several jumps being being making being made. Whereas with SARS two, we know there was only a a single episode that gave rise to the whole uh, epidemic. So there's all kinds of proof that we have for natural, that can be obtained for natural emergence. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, so when you're looking for like that intermediate host, you, I think you mentioned before that with SARS-1 and MERS, it took months, less than a year, but months to find that intermediate host species. We have not found such a species for SARS-2 yet. That doesn't mean we, we won't find one, but I imagine people have been looking quite hard because there's so many people motivated to find such a population. Is that accurate? 
Uh, exactly so. And the Chinese authorities have every incentive to produce the evidence for the intermediary species. Right? We can be sure they have been looking hard, but they've come up with nothing so far. So how do we think about how to... Um there seems like a, a a huge problem that's probably intrinsic to the very structure of a lot of the um, institutions that we've mentioned that has to do with responsibility and who how we can allocate responsibility for things like this. So, you know, whether or not it's a natural origin or a lab leak, what groups or institutions should be held responsible, at least in part, for this pandemic, in your view? Well, I think one should probably start with the with the virology community as a whole. Um, you know, I think they've let us down with respect to the, the general standards in the scientific community for coping with this kind of thing. And if I don't know if you remember the Asilomar conference of 1975, that was when the recombinant DNA technique had first been invented. So the scientists who invented that were very open and upfront. They publicly declared this is a new technique. It has very, uh, it has potentially serious consequences. We're going to hold a big meeting to discuss what should be done about it, which, which they did. The meeting was public. They then set very high safety standards. The idea they could be relaxed in future if the danger proved less serious than thought, and that's indeed what happened. Uh, this was a very sensible and responsible way of dealing with a new technique. And I think scientists, you can point to other instances where scientists have done the same thing. And more or less the same thing is happening with gene drives um, right now. But the virologists with their gain of function problem, it seems to me have been much more covert. They've handled it behind doors. The whole regulatory procedure is totally opaque. No one knows who makes the decisions on what experiments can be done and what cannot be done, uh, they've simply gone a different route. And I think professions that fail to regulate themselves deserve to get regulated by others. And, and I, I, think, I think we should look at how the biology community has handled this. And I, th I think we're going to see that there was this split, as you mentioned, and the split was not resolved. Uh, and things have carried on very uncomfortably since, uh, in a way that has allowed this lab leak, if such it was, to occur. I think that's the first place we should look for responsibility. Uh, another place is there's an obscure committee of the CDC, as I understand it, that assigns each pathogen to its appropriate safety level. Mm. So it's on the basis of that committee that that you know, SARS-1 must be handled in safety level three, but any SARS-related virus only in level two. It seems to me that that committee should have someone overseeing it and saying, um, look, guys, any virus related to SARS should be handled in level four, no matter the inconvenience caused to your members. I see. So, so you stated that, you know, when, if the scientists themselves are any are going to be granted the right to come up with the the way that they themselves are going to handle research. That how the rules, the rules and the procedures and, and the precautionary measures they come up with should be done transparently in a way that's um, publicly visible. And that has been done in the past in other fields, but it has not been done more recently with gain of function research by the virology community. Yeah, that's my opinion. It may be misinformed, but just from following this issue, it seems the virologists have not handled this this issue with the transparency that you that you rightly say is, is necessary to keep the public's trust. Yeah, another thing that occurs to me that that applies here, but it's not specific to virology, is just just the general the the way that one goes about getting and justifying getting a grant to do scientific research. You know, generally speaking, when you're writing a grant, it's a very labor intensive process. In fact, most lab heads spend a majority of their time writing grants and doing things related to raising that money because that's what keeps all of the research going. And it's actually also how universities generate a lot of revenue because so much of that money just goes right to the university. But the way that you basically get a grant, the way that you write a good grant, is you have to make it very clear that your research is very important 
And the way that you typically justify that your research is very important is that you're either going to prevent something very bad from happening or that you're working with something very deadly that could lead to something very bad if the grant doesn't get funded. And, you know, it's very sort of easy to see as you've unpacked the story for us, how the virology community itself is almost incentivized to try and, you know, come as close as they can to creating the very bugs that we're now dealing with in this pandemic. It seems to me that the incentives are aligned in that way. And that if the structure of that system doesn't change at all, this is sort of bound to happen. Well, that's a very subtle point that you've identified. And indeed, it's the, it's the contention of many of the critics of this research that this, this is the main reason why it's done. It's not to save the world from epidemics. It's because it's a wonderful excuse for raising money and doing dangerous experiments, which can be assured of publication in Science or Nature. Interesting. Um, one of the last things uh, I'll simply ask you about is, you know, what can be done on the U.S. side by the authorities here um, if we really wanted to get to the bottom of this? There was a quote I picked out from one of your articles in Medium, and it said, if Congress were at all interested in the origins of the virus, why would it not subpoena Dr. Dasek to turn over all of his records and explain under oath everything he knows about the research he funded at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? So that is presumably something that could easily easily be done. Do you think it's likely that that, that will happen? I think it's quite possible that it will happen. And the reason that it's been prevented from now is that, is that this has bizarrely become such a partisan issue. I, I mean, for you and me, it's just a scientific issue, and, and all we want is for the scientific facts to come out. But because the whole origin question became polarized, uh, you know, starting with sort of Trump's statement, so you know, if Trump said it came from the Wuhan lab, therefore it couldn't have done. This was sort of schoolboy logic that seems to prevail in, in our major newsrooms and in Congress. Therefore, there's there's been a sort of political split on this issue. So it's because the way the cookie has crumbled, the left is against lab leak and the right is for it. I mean, it could have been the other way around, but that's the way it's come out, totally arbitrary. So uh, uh, at present, the, the, the left in Congress is blocking the right's attempt to find out what DASAC and the NIH knows. But in fact, in, the, in DASAC's records, and after all, he was the principal investigator. He must have had copious information and progress reports streaming back to him from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, he has all. He has the the DARPA proposal. Goodness knows what else are in his records. And since it's all public money, presumably, it's it's subject to congressional subpoenas. So it, it, it just beats the heck out of me why Congress is not interested enough to do that. And similarly, the NIH must have lots of information it hasn't um, shared with us. And so, so NIH and EcoHealth have been allowed to, to sort of sit tight and, and stonewall responsible inquiry into the origins of the virus. I, I can't think this will be allowed to continue for much longer. I hope it doesn't. Hmm. Well, what would you say? So, you know, some people have articulated the view that it doesn't really matter how this pandemic got started. The fact is it's here and, and we have to deal with it. What does it matter one way or the other if it was a, a wildlife spillover or a lab leak? What would be your response to that? Well, I think obviously it matters a great deal because our, our response depends on the, on, on the origin. And if it, if it originated through lab leak, there's one large set of things we have to do. And if it emerged naturally, then there's a, a totally different set of, of remedies. So what are you going to be looking for in, in the coming weeks and months um, in, in, that, that's related to resolving this issue? Uh, is there anything on the horizon in terms of um, you know, documents that we might gain access to or, or other things? Or is it possible that no new information will come out and this will never be fully resolved? How are you thinking about the way this plays out? Well, I started off with that with the, the, the pessimistic assumption you refer to that there's only so much we'll get, we'll never get any more information. But so each month it seems there's some new uh, revelation. I mean, enormously good work has been done by uh, these little uh, sort of pre press supported organizations that put in freedom of information requests. And after some sort of long battles, sort of 
extract the information from the government. So we, we had at least three lots of, of emails uh, extracted in this way, all of which have provided important information. The, 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 the uh, DARPA proposal from Dash Act, which was um, leaked uh, uh, last week, um, that went to another enormously important group. It's a little collective of, of scientists who call, who call themselves drastic, and and they have uh, have done amazing work at uh, at sort of uh, traveling the internet, delving into sort of Chinese obscure Chinese masters theses to uh, uh, see what experiments were done when and by by who. They've been an enormously fruitful source of information um, <clears throat> and have put our intelligence communities to shame. It seems to me who haven't been able to make up their mind whether it's what what on earth happened at the beginning of the epidemic. So since since both both these sources have been very fruitful, I continue to hope that more information will continue to come out. Hmm. Well, Nicholas Wade, thank you for your time. Um, I want to make sure that we get you out of here in short order. Any final thoughts you want to leave people with about everything that we've discussed? Um, anything that you want to say about um, the, the stuff that you've written about this or any new work that you might have coming out? I think my principal observation is um, is how strange it has been that, that our institutions, our major institutions have failed us in exploring the origins of this virus. And after all, what could be a more important story than how this virus came about. And yet our media has been asleep at the switch. They didn't, they hardly mentioned lab leak until about a, a, a year and a half after the epidemic broke out. Um, I think our intelligence agencies, as far as I can see, have been similarly neglectful, have been similarly sort of persuaded by the propaganda campaign presumably Chinese in origin, though we don't know that, that lab leak was a ridiculous conspiracy theory. I think the scientific community has failed us by failing to come forward for the reasons we discussed. The virology community in particular uh, has failed to blow the whistle on the false information that they've allowed Anson and others to give the public. So in one place after another, people have, have not behaved as they should have done that. Our society sort of depends on the health of its institutions and on each institution performing its assigned function. If they don't do that, then our, our, the fabric of society just sort of tears a little. Um, and I don't know what is, I don't really understand why this has happened, but I just hope it doesn't happen again. Nicholas Wade, thank you for your time. You're most welcome. Thanks for asking.